first is just the current solutions are terrible. We have minoxidil discovered by accident in the 1950s uh, while it was being used to, to cure hypertension. It's just really not very effective for most, despite what you might see in, in various marketing campaigns. <laughs> then you have finasteride discovered also by accident while it was being used to treat enlarged prostates in the 1970s. Okay, but was finasteride discovered by accident? Although the hair growth properties of minoxidil were indeed discovered by accident, finasteride's anti-DHG properties, as well as its use as a treatment for hair loss, were not serendipitous by any means whatsoever. In fact, finasteride is a product of intentional and targeted research. Far from an accident, the development of finasteride by Merck was driven by deliberate investigation into specific physiological phenomena observed in male pseudohermaphrodites, and the strategic application of this knowledge to address widespread medical conditions. And for that matter, we could even say the same thing about GSK's dutasteride, because finasteride started the class of drugs known as 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. So let's see why none of this was an accident, despite what some people and some, I guess, companies, I guess, biotech startups, whatever, might say. Then you have finasteride discovered also by accident while it was being used to treat enlarged prostates in the 1970s. Yeah, hair dowel sounds uh, really cringe. Also, please keep this video in mind for the near future. There was a New York Times article published in 1992 titled, quote, Keeping the Pipeline Filled at Merck, unquote, which vividly recounts how Merck executives, particularly Dr. Roy Vagelos, who was Merck's chairman and CEO at the time, they were captivated by the work of Dr. Julian Imperocto McKinley. At the time, Imperocto McKinley's research was going around to various conferences, and a member of Merck's executive teams were at those conferences, and they passed along the information. Imperocto McKinley's work described a group of male pseudohermaphrodites in the Dominican Republic who, despite having ambiguous genitalia at birth, experienced significant masculinization at puberty. Crucially, they exhibited small prostates and an absence of male pattern baldness, an observation that Merck's researchers seized upon. As the article notes, the phrase, quote, the prostate, however, remains small, unquote, from Imperocto McKinley's description, caught the attention of Merck's team, sparking a focused effort to develop a drug that can actually replicate the effects in a broader population. However, this narrative is beyond the boardrooms of Merck, and it goes into the very heart of Imperocto's groundbreaking journey to the Dominican Republic. You see, this phenomenon she studied, the male pseudohermaphrodites, or the cuevadosis, as they were locally known, was far from an obscure curiosity. It was a well-documented occurrence within the community, with these individuals' unique physical development becoming a part of local folklore. The term huevadose, meaning penis at 12 or testicle at 12, whichever one you want to, you know, term it as, directly referenced the dramatic changes these individuals underwent at puberty, transforming from children that were initially raised as girls due to their ambiguous genitalia into virilized males with fully functioning male genitals. And look, I'm not going to go through each and every single one of her studies, but I'll just show it here on the screen and link it in the description. It was very, very detailed. She even did research on some of the older members of the community. And again, this is where it was noticed that nearly none of the men that had the 5 alpha reductase deficiency, which led to them being pseudohermaphrodites at birth, none of these men during or even after puberty and even in their elder years showed signs of temporal recession at the hairline or any sort of androgenetic alopecia throughout the scalp. And yes, they had those small prostates. So Imperato McKinley, as well as her colleagues, wrote in the paper titled, quote, Steroid 5-alpha reductase deficiency in man, an inherited form of male pseudohermaphroditism, unquote, literally has a description that mentions this exactly, and I'm just going to quoted exactly as it is in the paper. Quote, At puberty, virilization occurs with the exception of a scanty or absent beard, lack of temporal recession of the hairline, and a small to absent prostate. Unquote. So, yeah. Doesn't, again, it doesn't sound like this was an accident whatsoever. And further cementing this intention, if we go to this particular NCBI stats per article by Zito et al., it essentially highlights that finasteride was first approved in 1992 
as a 5 milligram tablet under the name Proscar, specifically for treating benign prosthetic hyperplasia, or BPH. And Merck's foresight, however, didn't stop there. They continued their research into finasteride's potential application, leading to its approval in 1997 as a reduced 1 milligram dose for treating androgenetic alopecia. So this sort of progression underscores that Merck had a calculated approach. They were fully aware from the outset that finasteride could serve as a dual-purpose drug for treating prostate issues and androgenetic alopecia. So all this talk about finasteride being a quote-unquote accidental discovery, <laughs> there's no merit for that whatsoever. If anything, it was one of the most intentionally developed drugs by observing people who had deficiencies that weren't really harmful, right? Sometimes in drug discovery, we look at people who have, you know, innate physical properties, right? Maybe they have some sort of disorder, and that disorder could sometimes be advantageous for certain conditions. And then we try to replicate that in the lab by creating a drug that seems to modulate specific pathways or enzymes that can elicit effects into the general population to treat particular conditions. And in this case, it was to treat benign prosthetic hyperplasia and androgenetic alopecia. So that was a lot of yapping from me. I'm going to stop this video now. Thanks for watching. We just hit a million total views on this channel, which is crazy. And I hope to see you guys in the next one. Bye, guys. Okay, so I'm here at the end of the video, and as always, all links are in the description below, but before we end this video, I'm going to show a clip from an interview with the former Merck CEO and chairman, Roy Vagelos. Now, in this clip, he's essentially talking about the methodological approaches Merck took when it came to discovering drugs like finasteride. I think it shows that Merck came with an understanding by observing enzymatic reactions and their consequences in drug development, and all of that led to them being more, I guess, more methodical in creating a drug like finasteride. Also, the New York Times article, the one titled Keeping the Pipeline Failed at Merck, shows just how eager Merck was when they heard about Imperoctum McKinley's work to develop a drug like finasteride that could shrink prostates and slow down hair loss. You see, they already knew the consequences of finasteride because they read Imperocto McKinley's work in the descriptions that she gave regarding the pseudohermaphrodites in the Dominican Republic. And finally, just as a bit of an extra, you know, pizzazz to the video, I'll be including a special clip from Martin Shkreli. Yeah, farmer bro, Martin Shkreli, talking about the wonderful people at Hairdow. Just briefly. And you guys should seriously give that Hairdow, you know, cryptocurrency biotech startup a look. I'm sure they have lots of great clinical trials that would be, you know, possibly rivaling the likes of Merck. So give them a look and, uh, you know, keep them in mind for the future. Or maybe not. Who knows? Who knows what they have going on? But anyway, let's get this going. So um, you transformed Merck from a traditional pharma approach to drug discovery to one based on mechanism of action and inhibition of specific enzymes. Can you comment on why and how you achieved this transformation, and has this model caught on at other major pharma? Well, the, the uh, uh, of course, focus on enzymes or ion channels or receptors were, the, were pretty, would come naturally to any biochemist because we're used to dealing with single molecules rather than live animals. And so it was a matter uh, getting that idea across to all the Merck people was something of, of a uh, challenge init initially because they were expert in other things, right. mostly pharmacology and chemistry. We, I thought we had the world's best chemists, uh, but they were really held back by the biology and, and therefore uh, focusing on the HMG-CoA reductase was a test for me. Uh, and, and a test for the whole laboratory and a demonstration that uh, that approach was, was good. And that went on from that to the 5-alpha reductase for control of prostate size to the new drugs for antibiotics, new drugs for hypertension, 
vasotec came out of that approach. Uh, the, the angiotensin receptor antagonist came out of that approach. So the prilosec came from that for, for hydrochloric acid control. So it was one drug after another. So once, uh, you know, of course, people love to, to win. And once it was clear that you could win using this approach, it was, it was just magical at Merck. And Merck research at that time was a magical place. I don't think you can replace pharma companies. That's, that's going to be pretty tricky. DAOs have uh, struggled to do anything useful, so we're not going to be replacing drug companies anytime soon. Yeah, hair DAO sounds uh, really cringe.